Don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. These patients taught me compassion as much as I brought it to them. It wasn't enough just to handle pills and administer the medical treatments or the physical treatments. Let's go a little got, deeper. You gotta deal with the whole person. So it's not about choices and it's not about diseases. It's about people's suffering to which they try and find some relief. The abuser can always tell with laser-like certainty which child has got the protection and who which child doesn't. So the, on your forehead, there's almost a neon sign saying, abuse me. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I'm sitting here with uh, Gabor Mate, a mentor, a teacher. He probably doesn't even know that. So I owe you a lot and uh, I'm excited to uh, sit down and speak with you. Uh, in uh, 2013, I began working on my recovery from sex addiction. I was mm. addicted to pornography, prostitutes, massage parlors, and all the many. And I was finding out more things that I was uh, addicted to as it, uh, as it progressed. And I came into recovery and someone introduced me to your book in the realm of Hungry Ghosts. It's a few years after it came out. And while I don't remember all of what the book said at the time, I had a physical copy, I had it on my iPhone, I bookmarked it, reread it, shared it with people in recovery, shared it with people beyond recovery. And you know the saying, uh, you won't remember what they say, you remember the way they made you feel? Mm. So I remembered going into your book, mm. I felt the two most prominent beliefs I had about myself were that I was weak mm. and that I was disgusting. And uh, by the time the wisdom in your book seeped through me, I just felt neither weak nor disgusting. So. Um, well, I'm so very glad to hear that. Yeah, I'm uh, grateful to do this in person when I spoke to your son about setting up this interview. I said I wanted to look you in the eyes and say thank you for that. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of your story, I'm curious how you got into um, addiction. Hmm. I know you're, I've heard about the, you know, growing up in Hungary and the Holocaust and being a family doctor, but I didn't quite understand how you, I'm grateful that you did end up in the addiction community, but I'd love to understand the story of how they came about. Well, we're sitting here talking in Vancouver and a few blocks away from here, a very short walk away from here is the Vancouver's downtown east side, right. which is uh, North America's, in fact, the Western world's most charged and concentrated area of drug use. So we, thought, we have thousands of people here, some living in the streets, some in terrible hotels, um, but addicted to all manner of drugs, uh, whether to be inhaled, ingested or injected, suffering for all kinds of diseases as a result, a lot of people dying of overdoses. So this Vancouver is a very shocking place to come to for a lot of people when they visit that area. And my first medical job after graduation was in that area. I worked there for six months and uh, with that population. And something in me always said, you're going to come back here. So you worked as an intern over there? Right I, was, no, I, was a, I was a graduate okay. medical doctor okay. after my internship, but that was the first. I, for six months, I worked down there. Okay, I didn't know And that. Uh, prior to going to family practice. And something in me just knew that this population called me. There's something about them I liked, even identified with, <laughs> you know. But then I went on and uh, developed my own family practice somewhere else. And I always had a few addicted clients, but not too many. Um, and then after 20 years, 22 years of family practice and palliative care work, I got a phone call from this dingy hotel where they had a facility. And they said, we want to get a clinic for these people and would you want to come down here? And I visited and I got into this old faded hotel with... You weren't living here then? Sorry? You weren't living here when no, you got the call? I was living in Vancouver, but not in that area. I got it. Um, so I visited the hotel, all these people and so clothes and haunted looks in their faces and cockroaches and rats and I thought this is where I belong. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I took the job right on on spec. And yeah. did and they I, know that you had experience earlier in life? They didn't know much about me. What they knew about me is that I was different. They knew about me that I was willing to take risks and you were out of the box. Yeah, yeah I was out of the box. You so spoke to your patients. That's what they knew about me. Oh, wow. um, uh, both personally and, and politically. And so that's what they called me, but they didn't know about my background. What, what was the mandate they gave you? Because I understand there was some controversy with um, early on, there was some uh, some health um, 
political person here in Canada had issue with some of the safe injection sites. Well, that came later. So um, there wasn't much controversy when I began to work down here. I just did. Uh, later on, when the facility called Insight, which is North America's first and at that time only supervised injection site, opened, and I was the physician at the detox branch upstairs, the Canadian government wanted to shut down this supervised injection site. And um, so the Minister of Health... Or so a supervised injection site means you're giving people heroin with clean needles, essentially. We're not giving it to them. At that time, we didn't have the mandate, but they could bring their heroin and they could bring their cocaine or whatever. We would give them clean needles, sterile water, alcohol swabs, um, tourniquets, and coffee. And if they overdose, be, they'd be resuscitated. But it was a way of getting to know them, getting to them to trust us, and perhaps move them on to more treatment. But even if they weren't going to move on to more treatment, at least they would not in infect each other with HIV or themselves. Right. They would not cause abscesses of their brains and their joints and their heart valves and so on. And so the then Minister of Health of a very conservative government here in Canada tried to shut it down. And I, I called her a minister of disease because if she had won, there would have been a lot more disease, right. you know, documentably. So we got into quite a controversy. The Supreme Court of Canada, which is a much more reasonable institution than the American Supreme Court these days, voted unanimously that they had no, the government had no right to shut this down because it, oh, was, an, because it was an essential health service, documentably. So when, when they hired you, who is it that hired you? Is it more on the medical side, not political side? There was a f facility or organization that still exists called the Portland Hotel Society, who began because two street nurses who were treating people for their HIV and their hepatitis and their diseases in the street decided the first necessity is housing. And before you can help people, you have to house them somewhere. Right. So they rented an old hotel. That's the one I first came to. The Portland Hotel. That was They called it the Portland Hotel. And uh, they um, housed people and, and then brought in medical services and some dietary support. And early in the game, they hired me to be their first uh, full-time doctor. So they brought you in hoping you would bring a more compassionate approach. <laughs> They brought me in hoping I would be willing to work with this population. Right, you to know. sit there and talk uh, to them. They, they didn't know what my approach was, that, although they did interview me. Right. And uh, the compassionate approach that you referred to, um, I was sort of oriented towards that anyway, because um, I knew something about trauma by then. Uh, but it's also developed in, as I, I mean, I, these patients taught me compassion as much as I brought it to them. Uh, you, you speak a lot about compassionate inquiry. Can yeah. you explain it to well, so that's me, those listening. Compassion inquiry, now we're jumping a bit. Um, so compassion inquiry is the therapeutic method or therapeutic approach that evolved out of my way of working with people, uh, which began in my family practice. Because when I was a family physician, I realized that people's mental health issues, but even their physical health issues like their autoimmune disease or the malignancies or their chronic health, asthma and so on, they weren't, it wasn't unrelated to their emotions. So that right. the mind-body unity, which by the way, shamanic and traditional medicine has always known about in Western medicine, or I should say Western science is not proven, is completely ignored in Western medical practice. But I couldn't help noticing that people's emotional issues and their childhood histories and their traumas were very much connected to their adult health status. And so that once I realized that, I realized it wasn't just to hand out pills. It wasn't enough just to hand out pills and administer the medical treatments or the physical treatments. It's called you got, deeper. You got to deal with the whole person. And so I began to talk with people and counsel them and, and ask them questions. So that's how it evolved. And then later on, when I got into psychedelic work, we organized retreats where people would come to work on their addictions or their physical health issues or their mental health issues or their relationship problems or their alienation from life or from themselves. Again, I found that the best way to get people to look at themselves is just to ask them questions in a compassionate way. So out of that experience, this approach called compassion inquiry evolved, which then other people tried to get me to teach. And I said, this can't be taught. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just <laughs> doing it. Right. But turns out it can be taught. And now it's become a 
a, a program for therapists. We've had 3,000 students in over 80 countries. Oh, from, amazing. From, you know, a, 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 almost every country uh, you can think of. And um, so that's compassionate inquiry, the essence of which is the belief that the truth is inside everyone, that the healing capacity is a natural human quality. And if you provide a compassionate space for it, and you shine a light on people's issues with the right questions, that healing process and that truth will emerge inside that individual. Yeah, I often quote your line, don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. Yeah, so then that has to do with, like the dent on his side here, nobody wasn't traumatized. Everybody here was severely traumatized, everybody. Do I remember correctly in your book, you said 100% of the women were sexually abused? All of all the hundreds close, of women. Close all to the, 100% of the men. No, no, all of hundreds. I tell you, I say it's 100%, it's not 100%, it's 99.999%. Out of hundreds of women that I treated over the 12 years I worked on here, one woman says she wasn't sexually abused. Wow. All the others said they were, so virtually none. And all the men were severely traumatized. And it's not surprising that the population here is about 30%, 40% indigenous, which is indigenous Canadians. They make up 6% of the general population, 30 or 40% of the downtown east side population. Why? Because they happen to be the most traumatized segments right. of the Canadian population, historically traumatized. Right, and then seeing that, obviously you connect the stories with the with what's happening. It's not an accident who gets the, the addictions. Well, if you ask anybody, I mean, look, let me give you a definition of addiction and ask you a question, okay? Mm -hmm. So addiction is manifested in any behavior in which a person finds temporary relief, pleasure, and therefore craves, but then has negative consequences as a result and doesn't give up despite negative consequences. So pleasure, craving, relief in the short term, harm in the long term, inability to desist. That's what an addiction is. Right. Now you began this interview by telling me about your addictions. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask you what was wrong with them because you already know that. What was right about it? What did it give you at the moment? Um, you know, one of the things I used to say, there was all the noise left the room when I walked into a strip club. It just felt like the safest, quietest place in the world. So the inner, just stopped. a inner sense peace. of safety and inner peace. Great word, yeah. Are those good things or bad things? In Beautiful themselves? things, the best. In other words, the addiction wasn't your problem. Right. It wasn't your primary problem, nor was it some disease you inherited. What it was, your attempt to solve the problem. The problem of what? The problem of emotional pain. And that's why I say, don't ask why the addiction, that's why the pain. So it's not about choices and it's not about diseases. It's about people suffering to which they try and find some relief. And so the lack of peace in, in, in your heart, in your soul, um, in your body, and the noise, the mental noise that you were distressed by, I guarantee where there is also trauma. And so, sure, that, yeah. so that's why the question, not why the addiction, but why the pain. So can we talk about um, sexual abuse for a moment? Because that's yeah. some of uh, my story. Yeah. Is there something you've seen specific about sexual abuse that seems to impact people more than say other forms of abuse? And if so, why? Well, all, forts of, all, all forms of trauma have one thing in common, is that the individual is not seen for who they are as a valid human beings in their own right. So that... Uh, all forms of trauma. All forms of trauma have that in common, is that you're not okay. seen for who you are as a valid human being. You're used as an object or used as a projection of somebody else. Now, sexual okay. abuse, you specifically don't exist as a human being. You're actually just an object in somebody else's hands. It's very degrading. Now, however, I'm going to say something surprising to you. Maybe you've thought of this, maybe you haven't. I'm going to argue that the sexual abuse that you underwent wasn't your primary trauma. <laughs> um. So I did come to the conclusion, especially in my case, because I was abused over a several year period. Yeah. And when I started on my healing journey, my thought was, my childhood was good. This guy robbed me of my childhood. Yeah. I've come to the conclusion that my childhood was anything but. And the fact of the matter is, and the proof of that is that I didn't go back to my mom after I was sexually abused. And in fact, you know, I, I hope my dad isn't insulted if I uh, hears me say this, but it's the truth. I felt more loved by my abuser than I did by my father. Well, that's the whole point. So that, do you have children yet or not? I have three children, yes. Okay. So how old were you when this first happened? About eight. I was in okay. fourth grade. If an eight-year-old, this happened to them once, who would you want them to talk to immediately? Right here. Okay, now if this happened to an eight-year-old child of yours and they didn't talk to you, how would you explain that? 
Yeah, they don't have the sense of trust and safety and... What's it like for a child not to be able to trust their parents? It's pretty dysfunctional. It's a uh, traumatic dysfun environment. Dysfunctional is an adult word. What's it like for the child? For the child, it's scary. Anything more? Anything how about, more this, scary? How about terrifying? Okay, I mean, yeah. How about isolating? Isolating for sure. Yeah. Okay, there's your happy childhood. Okay, yeah. I'll tell you something. So that the original trauma was that disconnection from the nurturing adults. Okay, which then made you disconnect from yourself. Otherwise, you would have screamed for help right away. And furthermore, I'll tell you something else. <laughs> the abuser knew he was who he was picking on. Oh, 100%. It's, it's, it's not like, it's not random. The abuser can always tell with laser-like certainty which child has got the protection and who, which child doesn't. So the, on your forehead, there's almost a neon sign saying, abuse me. Not because you want to be or because you deserved it or, or in any way desired it or earned it anything like that just because he could tell that you didn't have the protection right. you know that's how they do it this is true for psychiatrists who abuse their patients or shaman who ab shamans who abuse their clients which happens as well yeah. any any abuser can always tell who's available and who isn't so the primary trauma happened even before the abuse right. started you know and furthermore he really made you feel wanted he did. I didn't like the abuse, but I certainly liked all the attention. And now I'll use another adult word, grooming. All of that that exactly. went along with it, the teaching me to play sports, the teaching me to play piano, the showing me yes. his baseball cards and his sports cards and yeah. uh, taking me to synagogue. All of those things that he did with me, I felt very special. I just didn't like the... All, 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 all the attention that you got from him, you know. And I've talked to many sexual abuse victims who kind of guiltily tell me that... I, know, I hate to say that I feel terrible about this, they say, but there's something I, I liked about it, so it was my fault, you know? And what they don't understand, that's, that's a false, unmerited self-accusation. They didn't like the abuse, just like you say, they liked the attention, they right. liked the being wanted. Why? Because they didn't have that from the people that should have given it to them, which is their parents. Right, when I look, this may surprise you, but when I look back now, I'm grateful for him in some way, because uh -huh. I felt like he's shown a light on an issue. And for the first three or four years that I was in therapy and paying attention to uh, my trauma and my healing, it was all about the abuse. Yeah. And had it not been for something so obvious, I don't think I would have had the strength to uh, enter that world. I'm not surprised at all uh, at your expression of gratitude. Uh, a lot of people, after they do heal from addiction, they'll say, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. And strangely enough, I've even had people tell me that who've had terminal disease that I was looking after and they say, Doc, I don't know how to tell you this, but this cancer is the best thing that ever right. happened to me. No, I don't recommend being don't abused or getting right. cancer as a way of learning, but some people do manage to derive deep wisdom and, and even um, uh, spiritual grace right. from these experiences once they open themselves up to the learning. And so that seems like that was your experience. So can we define that term? You used uh, the word healing. What is, what is healing? Yeah. So <clears throat> first of all, the word itself comes from an Anglo-Saxon word for wholeness. wholeness. So healing literally is becoming whole. And to transpose or actually to, to, con to contrast that with trauma, the essence of trauma is being disconnected from yourself. You know, because had you stayed connected to yourself, that abuse never could have happened. You would have run away. You would have screamed. Right. There was you know? the first time wasn't the first time. There was tests exactly. before the first time. Yeah. And and had you been in connection with your gut feelings, something would have said, this is not right. right. I better get out of here. You know, so that the fact that it could even happen is, is a sign that you've already disconnected from your gut feelings. In other words, you become split. You get disconnected from your body, from your emotions. So on the one hand, trauma is about splitting and separation from yourself, healing is becoming whole again, connecting with yourself again. Beautiful. I'm grateful to, like I said, like it brings it full circle yeah. where I was when I was introduced to your books and where I am um, today. Can we speak a little bit about um, ayahuasca? Because that as well, I owe, you, um, I owe you a lot for it. I'll explain to you why. So part of my addiction was I didn't have any problems. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was I had a sex addiction and it was explosive. But I didn't, I didn't drink, and I grew up in an environment which kind of encouraged drinking at a young age. It was common at 12, 13, 14 years old to have 
um, get-togethers, gatherings where they would say, say l'chaim, right? Say, uh, take a glass of vodka or a couple ounce of vodka. And I resisted it. I didn't like, mm-hmm. well, I didn't like drugs. Um, I didn't like gambling. And to me, I didn't have any problems. Mm-hmm. And everything was in this um, sex addiction, which doesn't really show up mm-hmm. like, you know, with a smelly breath, like alcohol or yeah. a hangover the next day, but it's as destructive. And so this was my view of any drugs, yeah. including when I started hearing about, to me, it was just one, you know, cocaine, heroin, ayahuasca. There was no difference. Just another substance. Just another substance. Yeah. But I had a lot of respect for you. And in 2018, I think it was, you were on a podcast with Tim Ferriss. Oh, yeah. And what I remember you saying about ayahuasca is you said, it's not a panacea. It's not a solve for mm-hmm. everything, but it is the number one treatment that I've seen um, for addicts. Mm. And it got me curious. Mm. And after that, I shortly thereafter, within six months, I began my plant medicine journey and it, uh, opened up a lot. What I'm, what I'm curious about is you only came to it after in the realm of hungry ghosts. That's right. So how, how did you, how do you stay so open-minded at, uh, at that age? <laughs> you... I, um, I, uh... I know I'm old and decrepit, but it's. I didn't call you decrepit. <laughs> but it's it is possible to be open-minded even when you're. I just I rarely see it. How did you? See it? I know you rarely see it, but you know what I've been thinking about that recently. <laughs> uh, you know that expression, growing older. Go ahead. Growing older. Yeah. Well, you, people usually mean that to imply that they're getting more, that they're aging. But when you put the word growth in there, what does it mean to grow older? Oh. It means you can actually grow as you get older. You know, so that. Um, that's a tradition in, in all traditions. But usually that, people become set in their ways, especially when your world recognizes an expert on a subject. Or you become an elder where you actually continue to learn and you continue to transmit whatever wisdom has been your fortune to. You would agree with me that it's uncommon amongst people your age, right? It's uncommon, um, but uh, growth and uh, curiosity have always been two values for me. So, Right. So being that it's a value for me, I'm asking you yeah. the question. Ironically, my, my middle name is older in Yiddish, Alter. Oh, really? Yiddish, okay. right? It was given to me at a, because uh, I was named after someone who passed very young, my grandfather's uncle. So they said, why don't you add the name old so that I don't pass? So in your case, Alter Cocker is actually, <laughs> it's actually very specific. Right, kind of, Alter, yeah. <laughs> not the Cocker yet, but uh, I'll get there. That's what I'm trying to avoid. I'm trying to avoid that. And that's the source of my question yeah. is what do you attribute that to, your ability to stay open-minded? I don't know what to attribute it to. I can tell you that it makes life a whole lot more interesting. Right, you, that's you for know, sure. You know, <laughs> Especially if you uh, bump into ayahuasca. Well, you know, there's that famous... Um, Buddhist uh, Roshi teacher called Suzuki Roshi who talked wrote this book called Beginner's Mind. Okay. And uh, which is the attitude that the meditator is to have, you know. And um, I've also done a program where they talk about how we know what we know, what we don't know, and we and we know what we don't know, what we um, about certain things, but of many things we don't know what we don't know, you know. Right. And to know that we don't know what we don't know keeps you open-minded, you know? So I don't know what to, to attribute it to, what kind of fortune, but I can tell you it's just, it's a value. Well, or a mindset, and that's what I'm, uh, it's right, a that's what I'm looking for. It's a mindset. Because it becomes especially difficult if people consider you an expert on the subject, right? They're bringing you into the room to talk about your expertise on addiction. And then it's only after that that people start talking to you about plant medicines. So people kept asking what I knew about ayahuasca and the healing of addiction. This is after this <clears throat> in Canada. It was a best-selling book in the realm of my ghost. Eventually, it was it appeared in the states and gained to get got some traction. And people kept asking me what I knew about this plant and the healing of addiction. And my answer was, first of all, very gentle. I don't know anything about it. And it became then more and more irritated, no, saying, <laughs> stop asking me about something I don't know about. You know, I wasn't that open-minded. And then somebody came to me and said, did you know you could experience this here in Vancouver? I said, oh, I don't have to go to Peru and to the jungle right. and some weird shamanic ritual. So I did experience it here in Vancouver with the Peruvian shaman who did come up here to lead some ceremonies. And I got it within half an hour. I just really got it because I... I, and when you got it, was it from drinking it yourself or seeing someone else? No, and I was drinking it for myself. Got and um, <clears throat> I remember there was um, maybe 40 people in the tent, along with a young couple, where the man had drunk the ayahuasca and his wife was with him and the young baby was still suckling. And the baby was still 
cooing and crying during the, about half an hour, an hour into the ceremony. And I just had these tears of love flowing down my face. Love not for anybody in particular, not just for my family or spouse or children or, you know, but just love in a way that I hadn't known love before. And I uh, got two things right away. One is how I had closed myself off away from that heart, from that love. I wow. closed my heart to that love early in life because of the bruising that my heart received when I was an infant under the Nazis and all these terrible family things happened. I also realized that, and, and that's what I've been running from all my life. So my own addictive patterns, which I have to say that when I was working with my downtown East Side patients, their addictions were far more harmful and compulsive than mine. Well, they weren't more compulsive, they were just more harmful. Right. But I certainly recognized myself in them. And when I did the, that hunger, that emptiness, that the, the need to get something from the outside to feel better temporarily, that was very much my story. Right. And when I did the ayahuasca, I realized I'd shut down my heart. And when you shut down your heart, you create a lot of suffering for yourself. And now you have to use the external world to soothe that suffering. That's the first point. But I also realized if that love against which I shut myself off is still in me, then perhaps if I can be in touch with it, I don't have to keep running. So I you can get it internally. Sorry? You can get it internally. You get it internally, as I'm right. sure you've experienced. And, yeah. and so that I realized this is what addiction is all about. So the, the loss of love and then the, the, the healing is the reconnection with it. No, I, I wish I could tell you that overnight this transformed me. It didn't, not by a long shot, mm -hmm. but at least I had a taste of it. And then I said, okay, now I understand why people are asking. And yes, I'm going to work with this, with this plant to bring some healing to addicted people. So to others as well. Yeah. And have you seen, I know you said um, once jokingly in a speech that if you were measured by the, um, how long your patients lived, yeah. You wouldn't be considered a very successful doctor, right? Working in um, port and uh, obviously with that community. However, have you seen success even like with ayahuasca and with compassion inquiry and these um, methods without, with this population, maybe people who are that far gone? I saw some glimpses of success. I've seen some temporary transformations. Um, the problem is that then people go back where? to their friends and to their communities where they're still using, where everybody else is shoving drugs at them. Economically, they can't afford to move away from there. The, the social system doesn't support them in their, in their healing. Um, there are no decent treatment facilities where trauma is actually dealt with. So I saw some openings right. that were more than, they were more than encouraging, B but the template wasn't there for the long-term healing because nobody just heals overnight because they had one experience. It, right. Those experiences open something up for you, but then you have to be able to walk through that door and, and, and integrate what you've learned. And these people don't have the template, nor can they afford to do the ceremonies. I, I, you know, we did it's expensive. Have, it's expensive. And, yeah. you know, uh, how can people living in the downtown east side afford to undergo a series of ceremonies? So, yes, I saw some encouraging um, hints of success more than encouraging, but I haven't seen, I've rarely seen long-term, I have occasionally, but rarely long-term benefits because of the support is not there. Do you still work with that population? No, I've been retired from medical work for 11 years. I'm having written these books. I publish now in over 30 languages. I travel the world a lot, speaking and teaching, doing seminars, webinars. Right. I'm teaching my Compassion Inquiry course. And as you know, my son Daniel, I just completed um, our new book and published it two months ago. So I've been busy with speaking, teaching and writing. Right, I did want to make one, uh, even though I'm, I think I'm in chapter four in the book, The Myth of Normal. Yeah. There was one line there, it said, uh, something found in ancient wisdom and the latest technologies. And yeah. I just love that. Uh, that well, well, the point I'm making there in, in the myth of normal is that the unity of mind and body, um, which traditional wisdom has always understood, and not just the unity of the mind and the body, but the um, the unity of the individual with the community and, and, and the inseparableness of our nature and our the way we are from our life experiences in community, in a culture, 
which traditional wisdom has always recognized, now has been proven by modern science and completely ignored by modern medicine. So where, where did modern medicine lose their way? Because it seems so obvious. Yeah. It's obvious, and yet the average medical student doesn't hear a single lecture about Why? trauma. What? They don't hear a single lecture about the mind-body unity. They don't learn about how rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis and malignancy and ALS and other conditions have all been traced to traumatic experiences and, and, and certain ways of functioning emotionally, which affect our physiology. They just don't learn all this science. It's just astonishing. They don't learn how life experience changes the functioning of your genes and of your cells and of your chromosomes. Right. You know, they don't learn all this stuff. Which well, why don't, why don't they learn it? Run it. It's um, gotta be a benefit in some way. <clears throat> just like addiction would have a benefit, that's why it exists. What's the benefit of not teaching them? Because they're not learning it because it's not being taught. Well, there's certainly a benefit to the pharmaceutical companies who, who fund most of the research because they make their money Managing symptoms. By managing, mostly by managing symptoms, whether of depression, whether of psychosis, whether of rheumatoid arthritis, whether of multiple sclerosis. So the money is made in managing symptoms, but not in healing anything particularly, you know, number one. But that's only a part of it. Right. Number two, the Western mind, especially, well, going back to ancient times, actually, the Western mind is influenced by the, the Greeks, separated mind from the body. Socrates said, 2,400 years ago, that the problem with the doctors of today, he said, 2,400 years, right. years ago, is that they separate the mind from the body. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, um, I thought it was a 100-year-old thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, this has only got worse, or I should say more accelerated, since industrialization and the rise of capitalism, where science really has developed and has achieved miraculous results. So we've been a victim of our own success. We, 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 we've gained so much and learned so much and benefited so much from this left brain scientific approach that we've totally forgotten the unity of mind and body. Right, it's almost worshiping science to the exclusion it, of- It's become a worship of science and a loss of the whole holistic understanding of human beings. Um, then there's the fact that medical education is for a lot of people very traumatic. And, 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 and doctors put up with a lot of stress in order to become doctors. And it's very stressful to be a physician. They have the highest rate of suicide amongst oh, wow. all, all, all you know, according to some statistics, according, amongst all white collar workers. And so when they're so stressed themselves and they carry their own traumas, they're just not open to hearing about that stuff because it's too painful. So there's all these factors. But it also that, takes too long. Right. I mean, most doctors well, see you in Well, that's the other thing. Minutes. If you come to me for depression or for that matter, rheumatoid arthritis, it's a matter of minutes for me to write a prescription for a pill that's going to mitigate your symptoms, to sit down and talk to you about it. What stresses in your life keep you pushing down your emotions, which is what depression is all about. Right. Or what stresses in your life may have um, triggered the flare up of your arthritis. That's going to take time, not just psychological insight and awareness, but also time. So the insurance schemes mitigate against, or militate, I should say militate against. Militate against. Uh, against uh, spending time with people. So there's both the predisposition and basically ignorance of physicians and of, of the modern science, let alone traditional wisdom. And there is the commercialization of medicine, which, which forbids um, or, or prohibits, or I should say, uh, at least discourages spending time with people as human beings. You stay away when you're speaking, I think, I haven't seen everything, but from using spiritual terminology, but a yeah. lot of people make the same points you're making about the connections between everything and the connections between a person, and we'll just use a, a spiritual term there. Are you yeah. doing that intentionally? I speak according to the language that I developed and that I've learned and that I'm comfortable with, and uh, the last thing I want to do is put myself out as any kind of a spiritual right. master. I'm not. I, my own spiritual practice is very undisciplined and uh, inconsistent. and. Uh, it's not totally lacking, and I've had some spiritual um, experiences where I've learned some things, but I'm not somebody grounded in that tradition or language. So I don't want to. Right, so you want to go. I, I, I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to use language that isn't um, an authentic reflection of of where I'm at. Understood. 
Uh, so let me tell you where I'm going um, with that question. I also haven't heard you talk much about the 12 steps, but when you said about the people who you've seen temporary openings yeah. when they took ayahuasca, and then afterwards there was nowhere to go back to. Mm. So obviously, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't struggling with the socioeconomic challenges or mm. the others of the people that you had, that you were working with in the Portland hotel, but my friends were going to strip clubs yeah, and that's who I was hanging out with yeah. until I went to the 12 steps and then had a new set of friends yeah. over there. So yeah. you don't talk much about um, the 12 steps, thoughts on it? Well, in, in the realm of hunger ghost, actually, um, if you wanna go back to it, I have an appendix on the 12 steps, in which I re-language the words in, re-language the 12 steps in words that make okay, sense to me. Because the, um, the original languaging can become some of sort of a semi-fundamentalist uh, evangelical or Christian right. tradition. And so that language, well, it, you know, it's, like the Ten Commandments, you know, you, you know, it's a certain kind of language, you know. Right. So um, people have to sometimes struggle their way through language to get to the fundamental concepts. But it's in the same way, I would relanguage the Ten Commandments in a way that no, I'm not somebody who believes in a kind of um, God that the traditional entity that exists as a almost like a humanoid person, you know? Um, right. But on this, at the same time, if I, if you take the statement, uh, I'm a jealous God, you should have no gods, you know, you think, well, why would God be jealous, you know? But, 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 but if you actually look at the meaning, if, 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 we, if we substitute truth, ultimate truth for God, then if you put anything else in front of the truth, you're gonna create suffering for yourself. Right. So in that sense, I'm a jealous God, thou shalt have no other gods before me, makes perfect sense. And the same with the 12 steps. So the first step is that I recognize that I was powerless. Right. Now, people that are abused will say, oh yeah, I'm powerless, but I was powerless when I was abused. Right. <laughs> but if you actually look at it, what it really means, it means that my little ego has been powerless over this addiction process. And I'm gonna admit that. When you admit that, you gain power. Exactly. You know, the second step. Or I often say powerless, not choiceless. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Meaning once we go past a certain point, it's, you know, if, if I walk into the restaurant, it's hard. It's hard. At that point, I'm going to have a hard time being a disciplined order. I, I used to be the same with my shopping addiction. I literally would spend thousands of dollars on my chosen product. Half an hour later, I had to go back to the store. And literally, I could say I had no power, you know, over that. Right. You know? And at so, the 12 steps, they teach those barriers before. Yeah. Don't go in the club. Don't go into the bar. Yeah, yeah. Go to the bar and then say, I'm not going to drink. Just stay away. Don't try to take one drink and say, this is enough for me. Just stay away completely. Well, exactly. But so don't to wrestle admit, with the bear. So to admit that sense of loss of control there is, is actually a way of getting back control, you know. And, and uh, the second step is hope. In, but you know they form it in terms of came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Yeah, right. The word sanity. Yeah, yeah. Power so greater, greater than ourselves mean greater than the ego. Right. You know, but not greater than our true selves. So it, it just depends on how you language it. So for me, the twelve steps are beautiful. They're not just for people addicted. Anybody in the world would benefit, would benefit from, from doing the twelve steps in the spirit in which they're meant. But they have to get over the language. I mean, no, no, my beef with the twelve step programs okay. is only that there's not enough of a conscious awareness of trauma. You so can we go, agree on that. You can go to the twelve steps forever and not hear the word trauma. Right. There isn't a clear. It's. A, I, I would say there is somewhat of a difference I found between say um, AA, NA, which deal more with the yeah. you know alcohol and drugs and a process addiction like I was in, yeah. um, as part of the traditions there, I don't say the name publicly, but it was one of the sexual recovery yeah. programs. That way I don't become the poster child for it if uh, someone sees me in the wrong place tonight in Vancouver. Yeah. So huh. <laughs> I'm not gonna be there, I'm just saying that yeah, we don't become yeah. poster childs for it. But uh, what I find over there in the process addictions being that it just cuts a little bit deeper into um, I find that a lot more has to be worked out in, in terms of healing a process addiction, where someone can sometimes take a substance and say, I'm gonna stay away from that. And as part mm, of that- Well, that's true as far as abstinence is concerned. It's not true as far as healing is concerned, because I make a, a distinction between abstinence and sobriety. True. Okay, it, so when it comes to abstinence, I understand what you're saying, by the way. I'll explain to you one thing though. Yeah. With sex, if I come into the room and I say, Congratulations! I haven't had sex in three years. Yeah, someone's going to pull me to the side and say that's not that's not okay. Yeah. So, 
the go- it's mentioned continuously that the healing is through a healthy relationship with sex in the same way yeah. someone in a recovery from overeaters anonymous yeah it's you a healthy relationship you, with food you Don't can't stay away you, you food. can't not eat so because of that yeah. knowledge it does tend to it's more common for someone to talk about hey i'm in therapy yeah. just recognizing that 12 steps does have limitations around trauma but yeah. you feel like so what would be the issue with you're taking with 12 steps it's not meant to solve everything Well, you feel like some people message it, it, it that way. Well, if they didn't see the um, addictions as a disease, which they tend to, but they saw them as a response to pain, which is you know not why the addiction, but why the pain. I think they would be that much more effective. Okay, so you disagree with the disease model. I disagree with the disease model, right? And I disagree with the 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 exclusion, not the deliberate, but the kind of the unconscious exclusion of, of trauma healing. Right. I understand. I understand both of those, and. Um, as much as I respect the 12 steps right. as That's, they are. Yeah. And and what about the spiritual component of the 12 steps and that it's rooted in uh, this this idea that in order to heal, we need a spiritual awakening, a conscious contact with a higher power, things like that. Look, um, the French philosopher, writer, Blaise Pascal, once said that inside every human being, there's a God-shaped hole, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, if you look at the Kabbalistic tradition about the shards of light that were scattered throughout the universe and right. in each soul, but we become disconnected from it and our longing is for unity. You know, uh, virtually every tradition understands that uh, human beings, the, the, the West, the medicine wheel of indigenous people in North America, that, that, that health consists of four quadrants, the social, um, the physical, the psychological and the spiritual, you know, but the physical, psychological, social, and the, and then the spiritual, you know, so that hardly anybody uh, from any tradition doesn't have some sense that spirituality is just part of human nature. In other words, right. we, we need to belong to something greater. Not that we need to belong to something greater, but that we do. You know, in fact, when you think about it, um, I mean, whether you look at it in terms of the Tanakh, you know, and and, 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 and Genesis, or oh, they look at it from a scientific point of view, we came from the earth, didn't we? I mean, Adam means right. earth, Land, earth yeah. you know, and, and, and we know that, we, you know, from a scientific point of view, there wasn't any creatures or any life of any sort. First, there was the void, you know, and then something happened, and then there was the earth, and then from that came all creatures and so on. So that it's not that we have a need to belong to something, it's that we actually are a part of something much greater. Now that's what spirituality I think represents. That's a part of who we are. So I think it's a powerful ally. Now some people can be spiritual without even realizing it, right? you know, but there's always a sense that there's something much greater that they were a part of than the little mind can imagine. Got it. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you don't like using this language because you don't feel it represents you and you don't want to alienate others, but it's consistent with your view of the world. Well, when you get further in this book, the last, the, the second to last chapter is on spirituality. Uh, oh, cool. And, uh, cool. and that was the last chapter in Iran with Hunger Ghosts as well. So I don't know why I don't remember the uh, 12 steps, but I'll look it up today. Well, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's in the appendix of... Uh, in a realm of okay. and the last chapter is on actually on spirituality, and in this case, the second to last chapter that the book Diane and I wrote together is also on spirituality, our understanding of it. Awesome. You were mentioning about um, Adam, right, with yeah. in Hebrew, yeah, and Adam, yeah, right. So I mean, Adama, right, the land, yeah. Adam. So I think in uh, this book, which. Yeah. Um, a shaman I work with, yeah. Shaman Omar Ahmadzai, he uh, asked me to give to you. Yeah. He makes a connection between the word Adam and Adam, uh-huh. the uh, the particle, the Adam. Okay, very good. So, yeah. anyway, this, so he has it on video that I've... Uh, now, is given. he um, from a Sufi tradition or where is he from? Uh, I see, is it, is it an Islamic name? Yeah, he has an Islamic name. His family's from Afghanistan. Okay, Afghanistan. And uh, yeah. he came by it... Um, you know, himself getting into ayahuasca and at some yeah. point in an early ceremony, okay. it was uh, clear to him that this is his mission. I spent 10 years in the Amazon. Interesting. Um, he's led a couple thousand ceremonies, over 10,000 people through ayahuasca. He's amazing. Amazing. Very experienced. Uh, amazing. Guy. Hopefully one day you'll meet him. That'd be, that'd be great. Thank you for the book. Yeah, absolutely. I guess um, last question, because I have um, 
a number of Orthodox Jewish listeners. Yeah. And to me, it's important that they are able to relate to when they hear your message and mm. everything else. So um, you've made certain comments on Israel that I know would alienate them. And I have mm -hmm. no intention of um, going into that discussion. But what I'm interested in your perspective is what advice would you give someone in order to not get lost in those areas where there's never going to be agreement on and still be able to hear you for these messages on addiction and recovery and healing and trauma, which for me has changed my life. And I wouldn't want any listener to, to block you out and say, hey, he doesn't have anything to offer me because, uh, because it was used on Israel. Well, I don't know exactly what to say to that, except I appreciate your openness, despite our probable disagreement about those political issues. What I, what I can tell you is that the part of Jewish tradition that I value the highest, and I think f which makes this religion almost unique in the world, is um, the prophetic tradition. And the prophetic tradition is all about what? It's all about there's a higher truth than state, nation, and hierarchy. And, 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 and that the truth and justice is more important than any sense of identity. And that's what the prophets all said. Correct. And uh, I have to say to the credit of our particular tradition that we're almost the only tradition that actually puts dissent and criticality and questioning and raises it to a, such a high value. You know, now, it's also true that the prophets in their own time are never listened to. You right, know? exactly. Never. <laughs> so what I can tell you about Zionism is, is that I've, and I used to be a very fervid Zionist and all my three kids spent a year in Israel and um, the right from the beginning, there was religious and spiritual Jews and political Jews and secular Jews who questioned this, this project. And, uh, People don't have to agree with me to recognize that that questioning and that criticism, that willingness to look at ourselves and hold ourselves to no higher, but to no lower moral values than anybody else um, is very much part of not only of our tradition, but also part of the history of the Zionist movement. I place myself in that tradition, if, if people have trouble with that, I totally understand it, because I used to have very strong things about this myself. I used to think what you think, I used to believe what you believe, but you talked about my open-mindedness. Right. Uh, that part of that had to be curiosity about what is the other person's experience? What is the experience of the other side in this? And so I've been interested in that. If you're not interested in it, don't find out. If you find out, you'll be surprised. But either way, I ground myself in a tradition that believes in questioning, believes in not automatically identifying with any entity, but in looking for the truth. And if you can respect that, then you will be interested in the truth that I speak about addictions or health or other issues. If that turns you off, I totally understand it. But that, means, for me, but, but that means that there's not much I can say to you. Right. For me, it certainly doesn't. And um, although on its face, we probably have a lot of disagreements about Israel. It may be that as we spoke, um, we'd see where we were, you know, more in line than otherwise. I often say with um, like abortion, a lot of people say I'm pro-abortion, I'm anti-abortion. Yeah. Yeah. But they've shown statistics where there's very few people on either ends of the spectrum that abortion is always OK up until the baby is yeah. born. Abortion is never OK. But sometimes uh, the extremist positions get the most. Um, well, well, I don't know that anybody would say that it's OK until the baby's born. That's what I'm saying. There are very few people yeah. on either ends of the yeah, spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the way they position it yeah. very often is, you know, on the right wing, they'll say, oh, we're talking about third trimesters. They're allowing abortion. They want to abort everyone. Mm -hmm. And on the left, they'll say they don't want to abort anyone, even if it's raped, you know, immediately at the beginning. And there are very few people, politicians like to pretend that those are the arguments. But there are very few people when they've done studies there's, I think, single digit percentages of people on either ends and most are in the middle. So we may find more um, in agreement than otherwise, but I, I didn't want to go there. I specifically didn't want to um, go down his road. It's more, how do we maintain, and maybe that's good, how do we maintain open-mindedness despite the fact that we disagree? And I, I'll tell you, when I first met um, Omar, Omar yeah. um, I had associations himself, just I immediately yeah. understood that he was from an Islamic background. Yeah. And it took me a couple hours of saying, 
let me put that aside, put that aside, put that aside, and just hear what he's saying and seeing the beauty and wisdom and teachings that he had um, to give me. And today we're, I mean, more than friends. He's, uh, he's transformed, um, well, he's didn't transformed that, life. Didn't Israel and Ishmael have the same father? The same, they did. They did indeed. There's a lot, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot there. And one of the, um, you mentioned about that, the, you know, the challenging yeah. That the tradition of challenging. I think Israel, the Hebrew word Israel. I think one of the ways to translate it is wrestling with God. He who wrestles with God. He wrestles yeah. with God. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's Jacob wrestling with God, right? Yeah. yeah. That's how he got the name exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is is um, your Jewishness something that's very important to you? Your Judaism. Well, you've you've heard me make a whole lot of Jewish references here. I'm uh, I'm a Jew. I mean, I, right. I, I grew up identified as such in a negative way to start with, because of the anti-Semitism in Eastern right. Europe. Um, it's one of the beautiful gifts about so, anti-Semitism. Yeah, they remind you you're Jewish even if you don't want to be. <laughs> yeah, I, somebody wanted, I, as I in this book we. I recall that a friend of mine came to my defense once saying, leave him alone, it's not his fault, he's Jewish. Nice defense, you know. <laughs> what a way to say. Um, but look, it's one of the um, great traditions in the world. Um, so much richness, so much wisdom, so much courage, um, along with us, some other qualities I don't care to celebrate so much, but there's, there's a tremendous, um, it's a beautiful tradition to identify with. And, and, and again, that questioning, like you talked about my open-mindedness. Right. That questioning, that determination to question everything, that's very much a Jewish tradition. To me, it's the highest one there is. And so, is my Jewishness important to me? Yes. That aspect of it. Sure. Am I a religious Jew? No, I'm not. Am I a, a nationalist Jew? No, I'm not. Am I a Jew? Very much. So, one of the things you talk about, to use the word, um, I loved when he said it about disillusion that everyone should, yeah. <laughs> everyone should be disillusioned yeah. at least uh, at least once. And I would say that's happened to me a lot with ayahuasca. It's disillusioned yeah. me several times, which is on its face a bad word. But then the way you, I'll let you explain it. But, well, 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 disillusion. Well, when people say I was disillusioned, I just always say to them, "Would you rather be illusioned or disillusioned? Would you rather hold false ideas or would you rather know the truth?" And by the way, um, I know it's a self-selected group. But there has been uh, examples of Israelis and Palestinians doing ayahuasca together. I don't know if you know about that. I don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. There's uh, an Israeli who has led uh, ceremonies for Palestinians and Israelis. Now, of course, the people that would go to such ceremonies have already... Right. They've it's already self-selected self group. Self -selected group. Yeah. But still, they do find tremendous understanding right. of the other's experience when they do that. Absolutely. You do might you, you might consider doing that sometime. Yeah, do you think it has the potential, that has that kind of potential to heal? Uh... No, because I don't think psychedelics in general will ever take over the world that way. I mean, I think it's, it's always gonna be a very few, my, a small minority who does iOS or who does any kind of psychedelics. Why do you think that is? Access, uh, cultural comfort, uh, finances, um, the uh, availability of people who can lead, uh, creditably lead and guide such ceremonies, those are limited. Ayahuasca specifically or even other ones like psilocybin? I think psychedelics in general. Psychedelics yeah. in general. Yeah. I do see in the U.S. now there's a more and more of a push to legalize it and openness. Colorado, yeah. if you saw that, just... Uh, they've, they've okayed mushrooms, haven't they? Um, yeah, and it sounds like others, other yeah. as well. Yeah. And I think Oregon. Or, or was it Oregon maybe? That Oregon they, did it a couple of years ago. They yeah. But yeah. just uh, in these last midterm elections a couple and of weeks San, ago. And San Francisco had just did as well. Right. Certain cities decriminalized yeah. it. Yeah. It was just a vote yeah. in, um, in Colorado as yeah. part of the midterm elections. And it was very narrow, but yeah. it was in favor of yeah. um, decriminalization and also... Uh, creating um, like some sort of regu uh, regulated um, treatments for it. So in, in Colorado, they've recently passed that and uh, we'll see where that goes from there. In any event, I've really enjoyed um, speaking to you. This was uh, an amazing well, I, opportunity for me. It's a pleasure. I could t talk forever if we had the time. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be seeing each other uh, soon. Thank you. <laughs>